screen. Okay. Where are the lots in William? The lot switch. Oh, never mind. That's there. Jessica, are you at the campus? Yes, I'm at campus. Okay, we'll close the door. That way we don't hear a loud mouth. Uh, a loud mouth. I think she's <laughs> holds the speaker. So screams through it. You want me to flip it. this camera? Yeah, flip it, flip it where we can see. Yeah, yeah. It says it should say switch camera and then. Yeah. Um okay. You give me a bunch of options, so let's see if this is right. You guys see my screen all right? Yeah, yeah. we we see where it says zoom. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Boom. Um. Hold on, give me one second. My cat just uh, decided she wanted to join in. Oh, and we got some uh, lovely stuff. Both captions. <laughs> Let me see. How do you turn that off? Okay. Hold on. Okay. A little closed caption action for you guys. What'd you guys think of the film? Did you guys like it or didn't like it? Think it was super cheesy? <laughs> I, I remember that. watching it way back like in hot like I, we watched it in high school or middle school or something for mm -hmm. some reason I don't know if it was just a waste of time or <laughs> uh, I think that cheesy aspect is definitely part of its charm uh, oh for sure definitely, definitely takes away from like the derivative uh vampire ass genre that we're used to like oh all serious and love lorn like twilight ugh yeah i was gonna say is is can you all see like my zoom screen there yeah yeah you can? okay i was trying to figure out how to um oh there we go okay so you guys can see the whole powerpoint now we've been yes. able to okay i was just making sure i because i can see like my uh I zoomed there and I didn't want it to kind of throw you guys off there. Um, but anyway, um, I got the great honor to do uh, the film The Lost Boys. Um, it's actually one of my favorite 80s horror classic films. Um, it is, let me see here. It's, oh, okay. Sorry about that, guys. You should be able to just press the arrows on your keyboard and it'll go to there the next go. slide. Thank you. Alrighty, so um, this film was um, directed by Joel Shoemaker. Um, he's pretty famous for um, A Time to Kill with uh, Matthew McConaughey, uh, Samuel Jackson, Sandra Bullock. Um, you got St. Elmo's Fire with uh, Rob Lowe, Demi Moore. Um, he's very popular for um, the Bat Batman Forever, and um, he actually done a couple other uh, Batman films um, with, uh, I'll make sure I say this right, it's Val Kilmer. <laughs> Uh, Jim Carrey, Tommy Lee Jones, um, Phantom of the Opera with uh, Michael Crawford. Um, one thing uh, I did find out, though, that um, he did actually pass away uh, June 22nd, 2020 of cancer. And obviously, um, it was kind of looked over because, you know, we were in the midst of a whole pandemic. Um, the film, uh, The Lost Boys, um, was actually supposed to be directed by uh, Richard Donner, who actually um, directed uh, The Goonies, um, another great 80s classic film. Um, Donner wanted to reference the film back to um, Peter Pan and kind of give it like this G-rated family kind of feeling. But um, he actually stepped back and gave like full writing credits to uh, Shoemaker. Um, and Donner actually stepped back to um, produce. Um, Shoemaker um, had talked with a uh, Janice Fisher and James uh, Jeremiah's, I think is how you say his name. Um, they had wrote, you know, the Lost Boys and Peter Pan kind of feeling. Um, and Shoemaker basically told them that he kind of wants the complete opposite of that. He wants to do, um, in his own words, he wants to make it sexy. And <laughs> leave, <laughs> literally, like, leave the whole family, as like, keep the family aspect, but not like, you know, Disney Peter Pan ish um he wanted the film to basically be like 
young and sexy and like this basically like sex appeal and drugs and rock and roll and 80s just threw up in this film which I think gives it you know a really good I think it fits perfectly for this movie um especially like when you come to when you think about some of the main characters like um you know you got the frog brothers um he kind of took he used them as for like the boy scout kind of like you know, in Peter Pan, you've got, like, the Lost Boys, you know, like, they're just little kids running around, but he kind of wanted to give them a more, like, have this rainbow fixation where they have to, like, you know, play in the dirt and be kids, but still kind of have this I don't give a shit attitude, you know what I mean? <laughs> Which I thought was, it was pretty, it was pretty unique. Um, the Lost Boys film made, like, $32 million in box office that summer um it came out in july which i thought was kind of unique because usually like especially during this time a lot of the horror films that were that were coming out or had come out were you know towards the end of the year like peak october so i thought it, i thought it was kind of neat that like you know like this come out in summertime which the film kind of gives you that summertime aspect too which i thought was super unique um, this movie also inspired, um, big hit shows. Um, if you've ever watched, uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, um, Vampire Diaries, uh, the Twilight films, um, basically kind of giving them, like, this whole cliche that vampires look like humans, like, they look like real people, instead of, like, um, when, you know, the old black and white Dracula come out, it was kind of, like, Ooh, spooky! He's looks like a monster. You know what I mean? Nosferatu. Yeah, <laughs> literally. Uh, just, just an interesting thing about that is like, there's if you don't mind me talking, uh, talking, um, no, like that, in in lore, there's a bunch of different types of like vampires and different clans, and you get different appearances based on what kind of clan you're in. Like the Nosferatu, or like the monster kind but people like dracula or like camilla you know those are very like you know human-esque ones but yeah. you do have like the monstrous vampires oh yeah i thought i thought it was super like i thought it was super cool because like you know in this movie it, it kind of like it kind of gives this aspect that you know when they are vampires they are what they are you know they look like this monster you know they got the fangs and the contacts and all this but at the same time when they're not they look like regular average people which I thought I thought that was pretty a unique kind of take on it especially during the 80s you know because at this time you had movies like um I think it's uh like the werewolf London werewolf or some something like that and there was a lot of horror films that come out at this time that kind of give you like a different perspective on how these characters were supposed to look kind of like breaking that norm of them Night, some other good ones I would recommend. Oh, yeah. What's it called again? Fright Night. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. I've seen pieces of that. I just haven't. I had to. I need to watch that because I'll absolutely love like '80s horror films. They're just I don't know. There's something about them that's like weirdly comforting. <laughs> '80s was definitely the era of horror. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. Especially this time. I have I have a theory about that, by the way. Mm -hmm. Be the best horror always comes when we have Republican presidents. <laughs> <laughs> right? Think about it. When the Democrats are in office, they don't have good horror movies. But when Republicans are, there's good horror movies. Yeah, literally. Just look, just go back and like look at the dates, like uh, 1960 with Psycho, right? 1974 yeah. with the Exorcist, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, like all the classics, <laughs> right? Yeah, for sure. You, you definitely got a point there. I, I, that's something like I did kind of notice. I was like, wait a minute. I was like, like, I looked up like a list of like 1987 films and I was like, all of these films that were released, like, majority of them were horror and i don't know if it was like just because 
or like if it was to scare the public you know what I mean like I don't know it's just super it's just super unique to see kind of how like you know your government plays a part in big films I think it's super it's super interesting but um I figure I'll go ahead and get in um into the main characters here um I ha- honestly I, like as many times as I've seen this film like it was really frustrating for me to pick just like three main characters, four main characters, because like the whole film, you know, it follows, you know, the two brothers, Sam and Michael, but you also have like, you know, their their mom and their grandpa. And then you have like David and his posse of vampires. And I was just like, I'm, I'm just going to have to shortly <laughs> cover it all. But um, starting here on the left, we have uh, Brooke McCarter who plays Paul. Um, I couldn't find any films that he was in, like that had become popular or anything. So like his acting career really didn't take off after this film. So this was his film that he was most known for. Um, right here we have uh, Billy Worth, who plays Dwayne. Um, he's actually a director now. And um, he directed uh, two films that he also was the star in, which I thought that was kind of unique. Like, how do you direct a film, but you're also the star? Um, it was Kismet, Kismet and uh, MacArthur Park. Um, I haven't seen either of them. Um, right here you have uh, Keith Kiefer Sutherland, um, he plays David, a very, very popular um, 80s actor. Um, he's very popular for um, his role in this, not only this movie, but also um, Stand By Me, um, A Few Good Men, A Time to Kill, and Young Guns. Um, it was uh, quoted in this film that even though, like, you notice in this film that he doesn't really talk a lot, he actually has a, an incredibly small dialogue for a main villain character. But um, I feel like um, his acting just kind of takes over and kind of makes his character who he is. Um, what did some of you guys think about uh, his performance? Um, de- definitely noticed that there wasn't a lot of dialogue even for like a, a villain-esque character because usually we get villains that just love to talk and monologue and i like that he let his actions speak more than you know his words because i feel like that's more of an impactful decision and i wonder if that was written for him how he was supposed to do it or just how he as the character decided to do it Mm -hmm. yeah i i had looked up and he actually he was not like interested in this role at all like he he was like no like that's just not for me, but he actually, <laughs> fun fact, he actually, like, what won him over, like, you know, wasn't his co-stars or, like, some kind of deal they made, but he said that it was the soundtrack, and I was like, you know, that's, for somebody who loves music as much as me, like, I thought that was pretty interesting, and um, he, I mean, like, the soundtracks, if, you know, you got the, the Cry Little Sister, which was made specifically for the film, it's an incredibly iconic song, through this entire film so I thought that was you know pretty unique for him to say that like you know the soundtrack won him over um let's see beside him um you've got uh Jamie Gertz uh she plays Star um she was um in Twister and uh and in 16 Candles um right here you have uh Alex Winter he plays uh Marco um one of his biggest films he was in was uh Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure you know, that's, that's basically what he's known for. Um, I've seen it. It's, it's pretty good. I, I really liked it. <laughs> and um, down here, actually, he's cut off a little bit. Um, we've got Chance Michael Corbett. He plays Laddie. Um, he he kind of fell off the, off the grid there after this film. Um, he basically just was a good childhood actor, and he just kind of played extras. Um, I know he was in... Um, another 80s horror film, uh, Pumpkinhead. I've never seen it, so um, I don't know. I might have to add that one to the list. <laughs> Sounds real indie. Yeah, I was like, I don't, I'm not sure about any of these films. <laughs> like, some of them I've never heard. You blew my mind just now with The Twister and Bill and Ted. I never noticed that was the same actors before. Yeah, well, they, they look completely different. Yeah. Like, if you look at Jamie Gertz in Twister... Like, the first time I ever watched Twister, I was like, why do I know her? Like, she looks so familiar. And then I was like, oh, my God. 
was like, her hair's just not as big, but she was in this film. <laughs> she, I, I really like her. She's a, I think she's a really great actress. I just wish like in this film, we could have seen, you know, she had a small dialogue too. So I wish we could have like kind of got into like why she was there and whether or not like Laddie was her brother almost, but you know, the film doesn't really specify that, which I thought that was kind of a, you know, kind of make you think a little bit. Um, right here we have the uh, the Frog Brothers, uh, played by Corey Feldman and Jameson Newlander. Um, Corey Feldman, very popular '80s child actor and teen actor. Um, he was in The Goonies, Stand by Me, Gremlins, uh, License to Drive. He plays in that with uh, Corey Haim here. Um, he's also in Friday the Thirteenth, which I did not know until I rewatched Friday the Thirteenth, and I was like, oh wait, he's he's definitely in that. <laughs> um. Jameson Newlander, um, he kind of, he didn't really have a really big acting career either after this film. Um, I think he was in another film called Bone Tomahawk. It was like an old Western. Um, I can't, I can't think of who was the main actor that played in that, but I'm pretty, I've seen it before. Um, that's a, that's a really gory film. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 compared to this, that was, that was like rated like TV MA, like yeah. it's, it's a it's a gory movie, but I don't know. I, I really like that movie. Was uh was it Kurt Russell? Yep. Yeah, Kurt Russell's in that. It's a it's a good movie. Warning, it's very gory if you want to check it out. <laughs> um over here we got Corey Haim, very popular childhood actor. Uh he was in Fast Getaway, Dream a Little Dream, License to Drive, and Lucas. Um this movie actually was the takeoff for, um, if you've ever heard of the two Corys, um, it's going to be Corey Feldman and Corey Haim. They were, you know, very well paired actors together, I think. Um, they do, there was a couple documentaries they did on that, but I'm not going to get into that because it's just, <laughs> it's way too much. Um, and right here we have um, main character, uh, Jason Patrick. Um, he plays Michael. And um, he was also in My Sister's Keeper, Rush, and um, Sleepers, which I didn't know he was in My Sister's Keepers until I looked it up. I'd seen the film and, like, did not recognize him. Tell, tell us just a little bit about the two Corys, Olivia. That's an interesting thing we should probably bring up. Yeah. Um, so they were – they kind of called them, like, the brothers, but they – obviously they're not um, – they played in all kinds of films together. Like they were very, very popular. I hate to use that word because like they were more than popular, but they had like a really big impact as um, like recognizing childhood actors and like kind of like what they went through. Um, I know in a um, documentary, um, I don't know. I don't know if it was both of them or one of them. I, I'd have to look it up. But um, like there was some sexual assault and uh, rape that had happened with a director and producers who like basically just took advantage of them because of their popularity and like basically how much money they were bringing in. Um, and the Corey Haim, he died at a young age. Um, I'm pretty sure it was drugs, right? I'm pretty sure. Um, but especially during this time, like the, like during the eighties, like you had like other actors like River Phoenix, who also kind of went through the same thing that they did because, you know, they were basically just looked at as, you know, a profit. Like nobody really cared like how they were treated. And of course, like, you know, Hollywood's gonna make you look good and like build you up. But at the same time, it's, I mean, it's really sad and unfortunate, you know, like how much they were actually like taken advantage of and like Corey Feldman now, um, if you notice, like he hasn't been in any like big major films or even like TV shows just because of like, you know, that still traumatizes him. And, you know, I, I could I couldn't imagine having to go through that and then trying to act like it didn't happen and try to go through like, you know, trying to be in other films. And I don't know, it was it was just really crazy. If I can find the, um, the link to the documentary, I'd love to email it to you guys so you guys can kind of give me your thoughts on it. Uh, about the only thing Corey Feldman's really known for right now is uh, the uh, allegations against Marilyn Manson. Yeah, that too. 
And um, I know there was some, like the Cry Little Sister in this song, I know that Marilyn Manson had covered it. And I think um, Corey Feldman had like made a big uproar about it because all the allegations is against Marilyn Manson too. But to finish off with the characters here, I'm trying to, I feel like I'm talking way too much, but I don't know, there's just so much to cover in this movie. Um, We've got uh, Edward Herman. Um, he was in, he plays Max, uh, the comic store owner, and kind of like the dad figure to um, David and his posse. Um, he's, he actually, you know, the plot twist in the film, he's actually the head vampire. Um, he played in Overboard, Annie, Richie Rich, and um, Here Comes the Monsters, which was also another 80s classic. Well, yeah, late, yeah, 80s classic. Um, then you have a uh, Diane Weist, very, uh, I think she's an amazing actor. Um, she was in Footloose, Practical Magic, um, Edward Scissorhands. Um, I'm trying to think. She was in a new movie that had come out here recently. I think it was called like uh, Queen Bees or something. I don't know, possibly. Um, she doesn't do much anymore. Um, she was in the, the newest film on Netflix. I think it's called um, Not Get Out, but... Uh, Shoot, I cannot think of that movie. Um, she plays I'll work like, for uh, you. What is it? I said I'll work for it for you real quick. Yeah, you have to check it out. I, I literally just watched it the other day, but um, it's a really, it's a great, it's a, it's a good Netflix film. Um, but to get in the movie a little bit, um, the movie takes place in Santa Carla, which is actually, um, it's a made up fictional town. Um, they had to come up with a name because they, California wouldn't let them use um, Santa Cruz because um, something like a uh, copyright too as well, but um, also during this time, it was literally the murder capital of the world and they didn't want to um, throw off um, like people coming in wanting to come to, to California. And um, so they were like, hey, you can't, you can't say Santa Cruz, like you can't use our name. If you come up with something else, then okay, so be it. So that's kind of how they came up with uh, Santa Carla. Um, the plot, pretty basic. Um, brothers Michael and Sam move with their mother to uh, Santa Carla. You know, she's a single single mother. Um, they don't really give you any story about, um, like, their dad, why their dad isn't in the picture. So it kind of, like, gives you this um, creativity to kind of come up with your own story there. Um, while Sam meets, you know, geeky comic book nerds Edgar and Alan, um, that angst-ridden Michael soon falls for star. Um, I thought it was kind of neat how they portrayed like Michael's character as a not really a father figure but like the man of the house kind of thing like he's kind of standoffish kind of uptight like doesn't he's not for like going out and party and having fun um, that is until he meets Star um, which it, it kind of doesn't really give you like much of Star's story, like she just kind of appears, which I thought was kind of, you know, random. Like they just met at this ginormous beach party, which I'll get into in a minute. And he's just like all of a sudden, literally um, starstruck. Um, hey, I know and, something about that uh, Santa Carla. While you, yeah. I've been just looking on the computer and stuff. But yeah. the, you know how it says it was in Santa Carla. Mm -hmm. it, it says this town of Santa Carla was used as the town of Santa Ursia. The town of Santa Cruz was used as the town of Santa Carla for their original 1987 Lost Boys. So it was really Santa Carla, but they just changed the name of it. Yeah. Yeah. They had to do that because of like, you know, the tourist industry and like copyright and. Uh, kinds of random stuff they didn't want to like have this movie just based you know murder at so, a real place yeah 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 um the theme of this movie um i thought um i didn't notice it until like you know i actually got into reading like you know kind of how the film was made and stuff and portrayed but um the theme is basically all about family um i thought it was kind of unique because um it was re released during like this new wave of American com conservatism. So basically um, they were using like political uh, political figures, were using Christians as like 
political force against um, war, abortion, uh, homosexuality. Um, they had these groups like go out and protest basically um, to protect family values and the normal. So like the film basically was like, no, we're not doing this. Um, we're going to fight against this narrative, especially during, you know, the Reagan era, uh, Reagan era. Um, so like, for example, the Emersons are the opposite of a nuclear family. Um, the nuclear families were a man, a woman, they were married and they're raising their kids together. Basically the man goes to work, the woman stays home, takes care of the kids. And, um, I think it was really like creative and unique that the, I mean, obviously other films have done it too, but like the Lost Boys provide a more empathetic look on like this atypical family and especially on like the Emerson's family. But also if you look at it from like um, Max's family, like, you know, he's kind of this father figure for, you know, David and his friends or if they're brothers or like how the, any of that even come about. But like, like a couple times during the film, um, Max references like my boys. So I, I thought that was like super unique how they kind of showed you two different types of the not normal family, single dad and kids, single mom, two kids, going back to live with her dad and be the man of the house. You know, I just, I just thought that was um, super unique. Like, what, what did some of you guys think about that? Uh, I think it was really interesting to have this movie really break that mold and especially to have a <clears throat> vampire film during like what would eventually become known as like the AIDS era because especially like in California and New York and stuff like that, you know, AIDS was a huge, you know, problem, which was spun against the homosexual community, uh, you know, because it, you know, it was mostly them. They had it in higher rates. And so, you know, like the president and a lot of government officials would blame, you know, the gays for spreading AIDS. So I think this movie is very interesting, especially to be a vampire movie because, you know, uh, AIDS is mostly transmitted through blood and blood on blood contact. So it's a very interesting, um, I don't know, just a very interesting take on it. The fact that they would release this movie during a crisis of, you know, something that relates to blood is just very uh, unique in that, in that aspect. Yeah. Definitely have that's, to a good, that's a good point, Will. It's just, I don't know. Like, I, th I don't think like I feel like when you like you know you analyze and break down like what's going on during these times like it kind of makes you understand like the themes of a film better especially this because you know especially during this time like there was like if there was anything out of the norm you were like banished from <laughs> society or you were looked at as like this hippie kind of like anti-war and then it's it's cool to see like how nowadays like there's still a little bit of that but it's more I guess kind of diverse in films so like that's our new normal which then it's it wasn't yeah which I think it's very interesting that you know especially back then you know we used to have guys in roller skates and booty shorts all the time and then now that's finally coming back you know like yeah. I'm sure all, I'm sure all of us have seen a, a fin boy or two on TikTok in a maid outfit you know that's awesome to see just because it's like you know we're finally getting back to like being able to accept men not being masculine and you know just wearing what they want to wear and just having fun with their lives and I'm really like and I really like to see that happen again because that's what the 80s that's what the 70s for the 90s were was like an era of like self-discovery for a lot of people and then you know that leading into the, the, the 2000s you know and it's finally coming to a head now yeah I think I think they especially portray that too like with their costumes like, you know, you got Sam, who's like, literally looks like the 80s thriller on him with, you know, all these bright patterns and colors. And, <laughs> and you've got Michael, who's, he's kind of like just this casual kind of, not really a jock kind of look, but like, 
kind of casual, bland, like probably wouldn't mess with him. Maybe, I don't know. And then you've got like David and his posse and they've got like leather jackets on, like the one earring and big hair and all chains. And I, I thought that was pretty unique because you kind of got like what was cool to wear, what wasn't cool, what the new kind of trend is. So I thought that was pretty cool. I was gonna I just wanna say real quick, um uh, I would be remiss to point out, but there is like a lot of like gay themes mm-hmm. in this movie. Uh, yeah. Schum- yeah. Schumacher, Schumacher is, was a famously gay director. Mm-hmm. Um, like if you talk, you mentioned the Batman movies he made, right? But you guys yeah. all know Batman and Robin. Did you hear that Batman was coming out and he's the new Batman? It's going to be bisexual. I haven't heard that. No. Yes, I heard that on the Today Show this morning. Yeah, uh, as far as as far as Schumacher goes, like if you remember, like the '90s Batman movie with Val Kilmer, like remember, like the bat nipple and all that. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He right. quoted about that. I didn't get to read much into it, but I I got the gist. And he said, uh, he said, as long as I'm living, that will forever be engraved in whenever my name's mentioned i mean honestly can we really look at batman and be like he's 100 percent straight he spends all his time chasing after one man that he's constantly putting in prison <laughs> over and over again and they exist to live for each other i mean come on now batman's pretty fruity if you ask me but honestly <laughs> vampires in general are pretty fruity and i can say that as a gay man myself uh vampires are just hot like they like they just are like i was watching this movie and i was like i can dig it but me personally i've always wanted to be a vampire anyway because i think that's cool as hell but you know that's just me yeah i always like to say there's more sexual tension between michael and uh the, the, between the two guys in the movie right Maybe, yeah and star michael and Maybe. david more than more than star <laughs> Yeah, I was like, I, like I remember the first time I watched it, and I was like, why, why do I feel like they're about to kiss every time they're about to? Kiss? <laughs> then, like, then when Star comes up, he's like, and I'm like, I don't even know. I think like always, like there has always been this sense that like if you're a vampire, like you have to have this kind of like sex appeal about you. That makes sense, like especially even like. Yeah, you got the Vampire Diaries, for example. Like, you know, you got, what's his, uh, Damon? Like, everybody's crazy about him because he's just, like, he's just open. You know what I mean? So, yeah. I don't know. I just, like, I, I completely get where you're coming from. And I'm sorry if you uh, guys hear some crying. My dog is trying to get up here. <laughs> uh, you know, I think it makes more sense for a vampire to be, like, completely like sexually fluid because that's the way that you get the most victims you know is to be like everything's all right with me but you know and then we've got stuff like teen wolf where so many of them are game i'm like you don't even need to eat people you can eat me like you don't need to be well they do have to eat me but (laughs) but yeah I think I think it's just very interesting to see like vampires that are of all orientations because you know gotta eat. Oh yeah, especially for this time because it was very risky at the time, especially when you had um, like other films like this coming out. You know, you had um, I did notice like especially 1987 in general. There was a there was a lot of diverse films, but like genre wise. But there was, like, this major drop of, like, horror films, like, galore. And it, it just kind of shocked me that, like, you know, usually, like, when you think of now, like, you know, you got the new Halloween movie that just come out, you know, <laughs> come out in October. Well, all of these films, like, were, like, middle of summer, like, like, peak summertime, which I thought was super, like, again, I don't know if they're trying to scare you or, like, they just were coming out so fast because you had films like um, Hellraiser, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, Dream, Dream Chasers. Um, then you had like uh, Predator, Can't Buy Me Love, uh, Dirty Dancing, uh, Full Metal Jacket, and like Good Morning Vietnam. And I thought like 
it was just like the most random like drop of movies during the same period of time and I thought that was like super random <laughs> I'll say something about that real quick um mm-hmm. Like most of the time, horror films do come out in the summer or in like January. Mm-hmm. Like it's it's pretty rare that a horror film does come out in October. Yeah, uh, they, I guess they do that because the summer is when people go to the movies most. Right, you go see yeah. these summer blockbusters. And October is usually a month that's not very conducive for profit at the movies for some mm-hmm. reason or other. Um, the Joker film that came out a couple of years ago. It's the highest grossing movie to ever come out in October. Mm. Um, I didn't know that. I I guess it just kind of like, you know, when you think horror movies, you think of Halloween. I mean, I even worked in the movie theater and <laughs> didn't even catch on to that. Yeah, I remember when the Rob Zombie Halloween came out. I remember it came out in like August. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, that, make, that makes sense then. That makes a whole lot more sense. Because I feel uh, like... It, if you try to release all these movies in like the same time period, like you're going to affect your rating and kind of affect, you know, box office. <laughs> yeah. It all, it also helps that they do stuff like this in the summer, because you also have to think about, you know, the cliche of every move, every horror movie being released in October, because like we have a new horror movie every like month and a half honestly yeah. nowadays so like if they were to all be released in october we just have the market flooded and none of them would make any money yeah it's super it's super neat to see like kind of how like time of the season affects you know movies um so a couple of the key scenes um again i struggled really hard with this because i was like the movie's like it gets so fast paced like after Michael, you know, has the um, initiation and stuff. And um, I'll go back to the videos. That way I can kind of like get you guys through this. Um, you got the maggots, worms, and blood scene, you know, when Michael, um, when they take him to uh, the cave and stuff. And like David's playing all these mind tricks on him. Like, those are maggots, Michael. Why are you eating maggots? Blah, blah, blah. And like, he's like, no, nah, no, nah, it looks, it's maggots, spits it out. Um, and that's also when they're like, get the wine it's not really wine um you know and you have star star comes in she's like michael don't do it like it's blood and he's like yeah whatever like you know kind of naive in that scene because you know after the maggots and the worms i'd i'd probably be the same way you know he drinks it and they're all like like mind blown that he actually does it then you have the um creature of the night scene which is a scene where um sam realizes what Michael is it's like when he's standing in front of the mirror and he can't see his reflection and kind of um one of my favorite quotes from the movies when uh Sam's walking up the steps and he's like my own brother my own GD brother's a vampire you wait till mom hears about this and I thought that was uh super funny because like you know if anybody if any of you guys have any siblings it's kind of like anytime you're in a fight it's like wait till my mom hears about this wait till she hears what you've done not me this time so I thought that was pretty uh, kind of like family oriented. Um, then you got the scene where um, uh, the bonfire scene, the initiation's over, time to join the club when Michael actually realizes like who they, like it's like he, he kind of knows what they are, but like this scene just like really sets it in like, hey, these people are killers and like this is, this is bad news. I don't want to do this. And then you've got... Um, the blood sucking Brady Bunch, Brady Bunch scene when um when at the end like after the fight scene um Michael um not Michael uh, Max comes in like he's kind of like he sees that all his boys are dead and then they realize that he's the head vi- vampire so you got to get rid of him but there was just um there were so many scenes in this movie that I was just like um you know like there they're not key scenes but they're you know they still like need to be there to continue the story so like the dinner scene I thought that was like kind of fun for like a you know kind of like a gives you a break into um like you know the whole vampires killing everybody um here was the um the 80s beach party scene 
Um, I'll get into those here in a little bit just to kind of talk about the um, the camera work and um, like the lighting. Like I, I thought a lot of that was super cool in this movie. Um, there's the bonfire scene. Um, a couple fun facts about this scene and like kind of um, like the makeup and prosthetics that they had to wear. Um, the contacts that they wore that they wore were actually um, glass contacts um, because soft contacts had not been invented yet. So like when they put the contacts in, it had to cover like their entire eyeball. So like the whites were covered, like the whole thing and like their eyes weren't getting like any, they would like their eyes were drying out super fast. So like when they had to shoot scenes with these contacts in, like it was like one take, one go. Um, I know, and, and the scene where David, like, they're in the cave, and, like, the, the single tear falls from his eyes, like, that was, that was legit, like, the, the contacts were burning his eyes, so I thought that was kind of neat um, to know about. Um, this is uh, the final scene, I'll get to these, like, so I can show you guys the videos and stuff. Um, some of the filming techniques they used um, that I thought was super unique, um, they uh like it was a it was a pretty low budget film um they had uh if you know in the um opening scene it's kind of looks like it's uh flying across the water uh, some of those shots they used um they used a helicopter only for like um the scene where they come out of um after uh the love scene between michael and star like when the clouds and stuff and you know you got the sunrise they used a helicopter for those scenes but um if you remember the scene where um, the police, the boardwalk police officer is walking back to his car and it kind of looks like something's coming right at him. Um, they were using those as um, point of view um, aerial shots to kind of give you this, um, you don't see it coming so it's scarier. To, so like basically like you know who it is, like you know that that's you didn't know them, but you know now that it's like a vampire and they're coming to kill you. So I thought that was like super um, unique. Um, they also used it in the scene where um, um, at the bonfire scene when um, Star is walking past Michael, um, you can kind of see it's just a camera POV. And I thought that was um, super unique. Um, this scene right here, um, the bridge scene, which is one of my favorite scenes in the entire movie. Um, a lot of people thought that they had um, shot this on like an actual bridge in um, Alabama and like it was rumored that they done it and it was like this crazy 100 foot drop and all this kind of stuff but it actually it actually wasn't um, they had they had took a piece of the bridge like they had built up this piece of a bridge and had hung it in their um, it's like a sound stage so like the drop looks like it's thousands of feet, but it's actually like a 15 foot drop into the cardboard. They just filled the whole room with fog. And um, I thought that was super, super neat how they done that. Um, for some of the, the fight scenes here, like when David and Michael are fighting, you can see this is kind of, I think it's called like a swivel table or some, uh, something like that. But um, they, have, <laughs> they have people hold it and basically they just spin them around that's how it works and I thought that was super unique and I was like there's no way I could do that I would be so sick but for um since it was such a low budget film a lot of um the uh like the scenes basically the whole scene where Michael and um David are fighting in the sky in the living room um that was green screen and uh they used more of their money towards that uh just to um like make it look more realistic. And we cannot forget about um, the most famous, I think this is one of the most famous and overlooked endings to a movie ever is when, you know, all the vampires are dead and all this and then the grandpa walks out and it's like, if he knew that there were vampires here, why wouldn't he have said something? So I, I think this is one of the most iconic quotes from any 80s horror film I've ever seen. But that'll do it. Um, you guys have any questions? Um, I can show you guys some of these videos here in a minute after, you know, let you guys talk a little bit.
Um, I was just going to say that, you know, I feel like this movie really inspired, like, the takeoff of the vampire genre. Mm -hmm. Uh, And this movie is really, I I shouldn't say it's reminiscent, but, like, I've seen The Little Vampire and I've watched that most recently, so it's reminiscent of that. Uh, And I don't know if anybody here remembers The Little Vampire, but it just gives off this very... uh, similar feel because there's also that peter pan aspect in the little vampire but this just has that like pg-13 uh peter pan vibe to it oh yeah yeah i'm I'm teaching dracula right now too in another class um i was gonna i was gonna ask you guys what other types of like vampire media have you guys consumed Uh, well, well, you know me and you both have seen Castlevania. Yeah. Uh, that's probably uh, one of my more favorite ones to date. Originals and Vampire Diaries, the only thing I've watched. Well, that is a beautiful series. What'd you say, Kyle? Twilight. Twilight. Such a good series. <laughs> Twilight for me is a little too, it's a little bit too romanticized for my taste. Sorry, Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I don't know that part of all. I just think Twilight doesn't have that true grit of like a vampire because, you know, being a vampire is supposed to be a double-edged sword and whenever you have like oh we can be out in the daylight and it's fine and we don't even have to really drink blood that much you know it just gives this aspect of so what's the drawback of being a vampire you get to be hot live forever don't even have to drink blood and you just don't get affected by the sun what's the point you know it, i just feel like it really takes away from it uh but I do, I do like seeing vampire films a lot. Like, uh, there's a, there's another version of the Little Vampire, and it's animated, and everything that happens is all within uh, within one or two nights. And I think that's very interesting to see a movie that has to be filmed at night, or like scenes that have to be filmed at night because they are vampires. It's something that you have to keep in the back of your mind that they're vampires are vulnerable to the sun, you know. Uh, but I think that movies and shows that take that away really uh, uh, just demean it a lot. Yeah, the rules for being a vampire changes almost like movie to movie, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. Like, like we, we could probably like make a list like the sunlight, crosses, um, not just any cross. It has to be a crucifix, right? It has to have the it has to have the body of Jesus on the cross, which is a Catholic symbol. Like Protestants only have a cross; they don't have the body on it. Um, yeah, and then you have like you know garlic and uh, you know throwing beans or like sand or something for a vampire to have to count or like inviting them in your home you know it's very like uh the rule there's so many rules that you just have to like abide by uh that it's like you just get lost Uh, and like it's funny too because after i'm leaving this class i'm gonna go be playing vampire the masquerade the tabletop rpg and we have to abide by that folkloric block like we have to be invited into people's houses we have to convince them somehow to invite us in and we can't enter their house if there's like you know uh certain like a crucifix or like garlic outside you know just stuff like that very interesting uh but you know it's it's like there's so many just rules about how you get to exist as a vampire. So, you know, it's not true freedom uh, as much as it is power. And I feel like it's the same with a werewolf. Like, werewolf, you don't get to decide when you turn, the moon does, you know? Yeah, I think this, I think this film used a lot of, like, you know, like the scene when they go in the church and they're feeling there 
uh, their cups up with holy water and like everybody's like what the what are they doing like it's just weird and then you got the garlic and stuff um that's like for one of my questions uh number two that I'd asked about um like was it a mistake about using the garlic numerous times and stuff and basically it was just like um the the vampires were lying and trying to scare them into thinking like that the garlic didn't work, not thinking that, you know, hey, they're going to scoop up this holy water and throw it in my face and burn me up. So I, I don't know. I thought that was, I thought that was pretty, you know, unique and stuff. And it kind of uh, shows. Go ahead. You're good. Uh, I was going to say, I, I agree that, you know, it's like really weird. And like, I, I'm a big fan of Supernatural. Like I've been watching it for, I'm on the 14th season now. And, you know, they're, they give you a lot of the like lore to it. And one of them is like dead man's blood. Like, you know, if you shoot a, a vampire up with dead man's blood, they like either get really sick or die. Yeah. And it's just very interesting to say. And the question that I wanted to address was your first one. Whenever you're like, you know, he wasn't in, in, allowed inside the house, but Star was because she's only half vampire, which goes back to like really like the first vampire, which is Dracula. You yeah. know, his son Alucard is a half vampire, mm-hmm. and in a lot in a lot of stories and stuff about Alucard, he's not affected by sunlight or silver or a bunch of the you know traditional anti vampire things. About the only thing that really gets him is holy water, and that's because he's only a half vampire because he's more human than vampire. Uh, and I just think things like that are really interesting to see, you know, like, where do we stop, uh, you know, in our blood dilution and our potency, where do we stop getting affected by these certain things? Like, are you a full half, one third? Like, it's almost like being a, a Native American or like black or, you know, just from a different place, you know, it's like how much of this percentage is in my blood and how much does it affect who I am as a person it's very interesting to see oh yeah I have to like I guess like to answer that first question basically the vampires like if you think about like Mac he was invited in by Michael which means that you know if you're if you're invited in like the garlic the holy water the steaks all that's not gonna work but since like David and his posse had just broke in and, you know, the big fight breaks out, the garlic and the holy water work because they weren't invited. So I don't know. It's kind of unique to kind of see how some of those like themes still hold up, even like Will said and uh, I know Keegan had said like the originals and um, Vampire Diaries. So I thought that was pretty, pretty unique. Yeah, and like in the Vampire Diaries, I don't even think they can step over the threshold. There's like a, a yeah. force there that stops them. Oh, yeah. But um, to to not bore you guys a little bit, I just had a couple um, fun facts that I had uh, found while doing a couple little bit of research for the film. Um, during the um, bonfire scene, uh, David actually quotes, you'll never grow old which I thought that was kind of cool for a Peter Pan reference. Um, let me see what else here. Um, the comic store is, um, sorry about my dogs. Um, it's actually yeah, still, it's a like a real comic store. Um, it's actually still on the boardwalk and they still sell um, the vampire book that Sam was reading. And they still, they, they still sell that original comic, which I thought was pretty neat. Um, in the the scene where he's eating the maggots, um, they it's it's actually a real job as a maggot professional, and I had no clue what that was. I was like, that just sounds nasty. Like, what the hell is that? Basically, he like controls the maggots. So like for them to get the maggots to move in the scene, like in the Chinese box, they put lemon juice on them because it was less harmful to the maggots and got them in their words, squirming. And it was, I don't know. I was like, that's that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. This is gross. Uh, if you think that's gross, there's uh, a lot of European cheeses that are made with maggots. No. Uh, I, like, 
<laughs> stuff like that does not gross me out usually like I'm usually like all four but there was just something about looking at them like crawling in that box and then the next scene is the worms and I was like that's just that's just messed up like I'm gonna have to wait until I eat Chinese food for a while <laughs> yeah. any of you guys gonna get Chinese after this <laughs> well I was gonna go get takeout but I don't think so now <laughs> yeah yeah that was that's pretty neat um um the 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 saxophone player when I first watched the film I was like this like where did this guy come from he's just like some random buff dude they found on the beach um he's actually like like he legit played the saxophone and he's actually um he was Tina Turner's main saxophone player and they said like before shots like when they like recorded that scene he was like doing push-ups and like curls like to make himself look like more swole and I thought like if that doesn't if that whole scene doesn't scream 80s like I don't know what does like that's just <laughs> it's just amazing I had no clue I was gonna ask uh, what do you guys think of all the music in this movie like I like to think of this movie is like death by stereo right <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's very similar to stranger things in that aspect like Stranger Things has a really great, like, you know, it, there's a synth in just about everything that is in Stranger Things, uh, and, you know, just to have, like, you know, because I didn't grow up in the 80s, I never got, like, all that, you know, everything, but, like, to watch Stranger Things and then to watch a legitimate movie that has all these good, like, 80s vibe soundtracks to it. I'm like, eh, I can see where Stranger Things got this from, you know, because it just has that same feel to it. Uh, and I thought the soundtrack was really amazing. And I just, I don't know what it is about a synth that makes me just 80s. And it, it's just yeah. good. Yeah, super, super iconic. I think like the two, obviously the theme song sticks out, and then the bonfire scene with the DMX and Aerosmith song. I was like, if that just doesn't scream like '80s, I don't know what does. I love the Doors cover at the beginning of the movie. Yeah. And then it shows like all the weird people in California. I think that's hilarious. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's a little stereotypical, but at the same time, it's like, mm. especially during this. <laughs> Well, you know, you had like the punk rock and people who were still kind of like mm, 70s hippie kind of thing. And then you had like the normal nuclear family walking by like with their kids yeah. in polos and eating an ice cream. I was like, that that's super, that's hilarious. Yeah, I mean, but I mean, like what better place can you think of a weirdo to go than California, you know? Because in California, there's just like so much like, California is the city of dreams and drag and, you know, just like, uh, you know, you just have everything that's different there. Like, there's a whole uh, show on Netflix uh, about this, bun uh, I think it's called Freak Show, whatever it is. Uh, and, you know, it's just like all these people that are different and they all live in California because where else would you get all this? I have to agree with that. I think what also made this film kind of unique is like, like there was a, for a horror film, there was, I think honestly, like for this film, it was just enough amount of gore, if you know what I mean. So like, obviously when you think vampires, you're like, oh, blood sucking the neck. Well, then you get this, if I can find it here, then you get this whole, um, well, let me lie to y'all. I can't see. Um, you get the whole um, like this scene. Uh, can you guys hear that? Yep. yep. You get um. Hold on. You know you get. This. <laughs> so like you get the like um the, the i think they call them the surf nazis and it's like you know when you think of people surfing you don't think of somebody with like a liberty spike mohawk so i thought i thought that was kind of neat um 
but for the film, like they use a lot of camera, quick camera techniques, like in this scene here. It kind of gives a lot of back and forth point of view. Like it's, I don't know, it's super drastic. So I don't know. I thought that scene was like super. That's the scene that kind of stood out to me the most because it's kind of like you get all this gore at once, but like it's still it's like not enough to be like um, I don't know how you say it like subversive to the audience. Yeah, yeah. So like it's just enough to kind of give you like hey like these people are killers, but it's also like hmm, that's what they do. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Do you guys think this movie blurs like the line between horror and comedy effectively? <laughs> yeah, very much. Uh, you know, and, and I also get like with the camera work in this movie, it's very similar to like, you know, um, like anime, animation style techniques, like where they'll make something look insane or just like give you this really weird perspective. I think whenever you have a quick moving camera like back and forth between a lot of scenes like it doesn't give you time to focus on one thing or another so it really makes you either become introspective or out perspective about what's happening i agree with that i think i think this movie does a great job especially with camera work and the lighting um obviously whenever they're around like you, know, you get this dark under this dark but you have a little bit of a light undertone and like some like even the fight scene you know you got the red light red and black lights and i think it i think this movie just gives off like amazing camera work and amazing lighting that could just be because it's my favorite movie but <laughs> i don't know I, I think it does a i think it does a really great job of like capturing both like the good with the lighting and the bad with the lighting i think i think it's just really really great One of my favorites too, Olivia. I have a poster of it up in my office. <laughs> yeah, I know. When, the first time I ever seen it, I was like, I was so like starstruck. I don't even know how to explain it. I was like, Mom, I was like, I need, I need to, I need an earring like that. Like, I just want to, <laughs> like, I just want to be cool. If that makes sense, like, <laughs> I just want to be that cool. And like, people see you out in public, and they're like, Oh, ooh, maybe not mess with her. And I'm like, the complete opposite. I'm just like this happy-go-lucky kind of person just talk to everybody and I don't know I just I just love this film like every Halloween comes around I'll watch it and I just I love it so much uh I I completely I completely get you on like that aspect of wanting to stand out and also not yeah. be like you know mess with because like I wear all black all the time but that's mostly because you know just my my whole wardrobe is just either <laughs> anime or you know like movie stuff and i've always got my hair dyed except for now i mean it's a little bit but you know like usually it's like a bright you know color just like because yeah. i don't like to be boring i want to be like interesting and people are like you know like what kind of life does he lead uh yeah not, not, like, just like a boring like one that, yeah. that's kind of like how i want to be and i was like that is not me i so, I mean, it kind of gives you, like, a lot of these 80 movies, they're kind of, like, they kind of make you want to be, like, mysterious and kind of stand out, but not really stand out. Just kind of, like, make this big persona about yourself. And I think I think a lot of mov 80s movies especially kind of, you know, fit that perfectly into their films. Desmond, what did you think of this movie? I haven't heard anything from you today. Uh, I like it. I mean, it's it's a pretty good movie. I like it. Uh, I saw it a long time ago, though. I saw it, like, I don't know, when I was, like, 12, probably for the first time. Uh, it's not my favorite 80s horror movie, though. Yeah, the, the greatest 80s horror movie, I think, is John Carpenter's The Thing. Uh, that, one is, that one's good. Yeah. That one's really good. yeah, I normally put that one on the list, but I changed it up in the semester. So. Uh, 
Yeah, like John John Carpenter is such a good director. Which I guess we're doing Halloween three, which we which he kind of shadow directed. Yeah. Like so, we'll talk about that here in a week or two. I bet I was a purposeful troll making assigning Halloween three. By the way, since that's the one most of the fans don't like. I mean, yeah. Uh, by by the way, I don't know if anybody has seen it, but. The new Halloween movie. I haven't seen it either, but I recommend everyone go watch it for specifically a woman with an iron coming out to fight Michael. <laughs> <laughs> like there, there's a scene where like they're all coming out like we've had enough of you, Michael. You know, chasing Lori around forever, and everyone's coming out with shotguns, axes, you know, whatever. And then this this old woman just has an iron like yes please what is that going to do to him he's been shot 10 times or more throughout the course of his life thrown down from a second story building stabbed burned to death and he's still kicking it i want to see it this weekend coming um i want to go see my friend in virginia they have those types of theaters there where you can like order food the waiters will come to you and stuff. Oh, nice. oh, like an Alamo draft house. Yeah, they got an Alamo draft house. I'm going to go see it at one of those. Oh, jealous. <laughs> I would say the, the best thing that uh, my movie theater done was uh, we were allowed to sell um, alcohol. That was it. And I think, yeah, that was only that was the only thing. And then like the our, our sister theater, like they, they had reclining seats. So... <laughs> I'd kill for any of those. The only other movie theater I've ever been to that was nice was a two-story car mic in North Carolina. But other yeah. than that, the the Logan Cinema A is, you know... Well, the Logan Theater is way better than the Pikeville Theater. Yeah, yeah that's true. It's a lot Pikeville, cleaner. Yeah. The Pikeville Theater is horrible. I feel, I've, it, I've only been into that theater one time and I was like... I was like, it's going to be a miracle if this building don't collapse on <laughs> <laughs> You know, my thing with the Cinema A is, you know, it's not big and it's not fancy or anything, but at least you can watch the movie. <laughs> yeah. Well, guys, uh, so Mr. very good. Yager. Yeah, I was going to say, Jessica, you're up next. Do uh, I do it Thursday? Yep. Okay, listen, I want to ask a question. You know yeah. how the movie is kind of, is based on a true story. Do I add the tr- true story in? Do I talk yeah. about it too? Yeah, you can throw that in there. Yeah. Okay. Now I don't know how to make a power <laughs> a PowerPoint. How you can, what? You can either do it in a PowerPoint or a Word document. Your choice. Like write it out and read it off. Yeah, like there's some hand, there's some sample word documents on Blackboard from students who have done it on Word in the past. Okay. So you can you you can go off that model as long as you kind of do the basic stuff, kind of like we did today. I give some context on the actors and the director, yeah. key scenes. So like the prompt and all that's up on there. Right. So, okay, I was just wondering because I knew that it was well. You know, everybody knows it was based on a true, well, kind of based on a true story. And I didn't know if you had to throw, if you wanted me to throw that in there and all that. Yes, send me questions tomorrow too, Jessica. Questions. Okay, I will. So it'll probably cut us off in a minute, guys. So very good today, Olivia. That was an awesome. Yeah, day. she done good. Thank you. Anyway. Yeah, that's that's a good model to go off of, guys. Which, so, now, where do I go? I'm on Blackboard. Where'd you say? There's, there's a set, there's a tab on there that says Zoom stuff for presentation or something like that. Okay. 